This is Green Seas, a podcast by Tradewinds about the environment and the business of the ocean. I'm Eric Priante Martin. As we discussed in our last episode, when the world's shipping regulator imposed a global cap on sulfur emissions for shipping, scrubber technology provided an out that allowed some ships to continue burning high sulfur fuel oil by removing the pollutant from the exhaust before it's pumped into the air. Today, the shipping industry is grappling with carbon emissions instead. Will technology provide a similar out that allows shipping to continue burning fossil fuels by simply taking the carbon out of the exhaust? There are many in shipping who hope so. Harish Plakatanaki is Chief Strategy Officer at Starbolt Carriers. Speaking at a Capital Link conference in September, she said that ship owners today need to work with technology companies to use existing tech to tackle their carbon intensity. But on the medium to long term, they need to look to emerging technology like onboard carbon capture. Of course, there are a lot of developments when it comes to carbon capture, to onboard carbon capture, and, and uh, this could be a game changer, especially if in the coming years we're able to find solutions that are able to capture onboard um, uh, the carbon to a large percentage and in a practical, cost efficient, and safe way. She's not alone. To start off the new year, Tradewinds reporters reached out to dozens of shipping industry participants and experts to ask them how they'd spend a hypothetical pot of $1 billion to make shipping sustainable, profitable, and resilient. In their responses, many mentioned carbon capture. Some were focused on the opportunity that the carbon capture utilization and storage industry presents for shipping. Other industries captured carbon, after all, is a cargo that ships will have to transport but many others pointed to the role that placing carbon capture equipment on ships could play in tackling the greenhouse gas emissions of a sector that's been powered by fossil fuels since the 1800s. Sigurd Jensen is director of exhaust gas treatment at Finnish marine technology company Wardzilla. He said the tens of thousands of ships on the water now will be using fossil fuels for years to come. His company is developing carbon capture systems to place on ships. It believes the new technology will lead to faster emissions cuts than zero carbon fuels in the years ahead, and it will be cost effective. And Wurzilla is seeing growing interest from shipping. It's you who used the phrase groundswell in a, an earlier discussion, and I'm, I'm going to blatantly steal that uh, expression because it, it really is a, a groundswell. It's, it's across all shipping segments, short sea, deep sea, uh, all sorts of trades, uh, be it tankers or bulkers or uh, or more specialized uh, tonnage. So everyone is uh, is showing a lot of interest uh, in it. And, and I think it's largely because uh, it, it's an easier way to uh, to reduce the emissions than switching to an alternative fuel. And it's a technology that is, uh, if not already available, then very shortly uh, will be so. I mean, we are quite far advanced with land-based testing. Wurzilla started researching carbon capture a few years ago. It was already being used on land, and the company came to the conclusion that it could be made to work at sea. The outfit already has experience with scrubbers, and the two technologies go hand in hand because sulfur has to be removed before the carbon capture can work. Wurzilla built a carbon capture system at its research and development facility in the town of Moss, Norway, where it has been able to remove more than two-thirds of the carbon from emissions. We're hitting, uh, say, regularly 70% uh, capture rates on an installation that basically mimics a vessel installation. The only thing that we cannot reproduce is uh, sort of the uh, the physical movement of, uh, of a ship. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's difficult to uh, get uh, 32 degrees seawater in, uh, in Norway, where we uh, have our test facility. So the ambient temperatures uh, are, are difficult to, um, to uh, simulate as such. But the company is planning to run a pilot project with Norwegian ship owner Solvang later this year that will put its equipment on board a vessel. All told, Wurzilla sees onboard carbon capture on ships as just a few years from reality. But there are challenges associated with carbon capture as well. Once you've captured the carbon, you have to have a place to store it on board and then offload it somewhere. And there is lots of it. Georgios Plevrakis is the global head of sustainability at Classification Society, ABS, which helps shipping companies comply with regulations and operate safely. First of all, they uh, consume a lot of energy, and therefore, 
optimizing the capturing rate will actually help with that, making the whole thing more efficient. Secondly, you need to see how you store the, the carbon that you're actually capturing. Just to give you some numbers. If you burn one ton of conventional fuel, say MGO or HFO, rough numbers, you produce around three tons of CO2. If you store that in liquid form, then you have to consider that CO2 in liquid form is more or less the density of water, which means three tons of CO2 is equal to three cubic meters of water. So run the numbers. This is, these are significant quantities that you need to consider. When I learned this, it blew me away because each carbon atom combines with two oxygen atoms to create carbon dioxide. Each ton of conventional fuel produces three tons of CO2. And a very large crude carrier burns roughly 100 tons of bunker fuel per day. So that means 300 cubic meters of liquid carbon dioxide per day that you have to store in a tank on the vessel. That's a big tank and a lot of energy that you need to spend in order to capture and regenerate the catalyst or the chemical substance that you're using in the module, in the capturing module, um, liquefying the, the carbon in form of CO2 and storing it on board. So this is quite a big number of activities that require capital expenditure, uh, operational expenditures, as well as energy to be consumed. Now, you don't have to capture the full 70% or 80% maximum rate of some of these systems, so you can cut a ship's carbon footprint without needing all that storage space. But Plevrakis explained that carbon capture is actually a family of technologies, some of which are more mature than others. Some will work better than others on some ships, and in all cases, Shipping companies will have to optimize the percentage of carbon that they ultimately capture. One way they work is to store that carbon dioxide as a liquid, but ABS has given approval in principle to a system that would store carbon as a solid. And this is where the challenges can become an opportunity. For carbon capture to work on ships, you'll need reception facilities at ports to collect it from the vessels. And there is a market to either put that carbon to use in other industries or to sequester it in giant storage facilities. But not only does solid carbon take up a third of the space as liquid carbon, it's also more valuable as a commodity. And because it is pure solid carbon, it can actually be uh, uh, unloaded or discharged ashore and be part of a circular economy sold as raw material for other products, which is immensely valuable. So you actually add value at the end of, of that value chain by providing some sort of a, of a solution for a circular economy. For ABS, as carbon capture solutions take shape, it will be important to run pilot projects to build knowledge and to tackle the training needs associated with bringing new tech on board vessels. And the Classification Society is already involved in several carbon capture pilots. Pavraka said that green shipping corridors, routes that are being developed between specific ports to serve as the lead markets for low and zero carbon technology, could play that role. These are, these are good places to consider as incubators for that. And because you have vessels that uh, can act as liners, there are also good places to start piloting and evaluating and assessing the risks that are uh, related to the deployment of such technologies. It's, 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 a, it's an easier way to do it. Once we start piloting this type of technologies, uh, then you, you start gaining knowledge, you start gaining experience, and that knowledge will be fed into rules and regulations in support of the further deployment of this type of technologies. Here's more on the environment and the business of the ocean. U.S. agricultural giant Cargill has signed the first ever order for a bulk carrier fueled by methanol. The company's Cargill Ocean Transportation Unit teamed up with Japan's Mitsui & Co to place the order at shipbuilder Suneshi Group. Methanol is gaining ground as an alternative fuel because it offers a smaller greenhouse gas footprint today and, when made with renewable energy and captured carbon, zero emissions in the future. Read about it at tradewithsnews.com. 
In addition to asking how they would spend a $1 billion sustainable shipping fund, Tradewinds asked maritime stakeholders across the globe what regulation they would impose on the industry if they had the power to do so. The latest edition of the Green Seas newsletter has looked at their answers, including proposals to ratchet down carbon emissions and to ban fossil fuels. Get the newsletter in your inbox or subscribe to this podcast at tinyurl.com slash greenseas4. My colleague Paul Peachy has reported on an Oxford University study that looked at which ports around the world are most vulnerable to extreme weather events. The answer, the port of Houston. Music for this episode is by Cube Sounds on Pixabay.